my name is Fine Akirai and I am chairing this panel and also the first uh, first uh, panelist uh, of practical reasons. Um, I wish we'd be back soon because it has to take some time. The line of thoughts um, that I attempt to uh, sketch up in my presentation uh, originates um, in, uh, two, uh, in the interaction of two um, researches, uh, research projects that I uh, attended uh, simultaneously. One of them concerned with uh, cultural theoretical approaches to contemporary Hungarian and Romanian cinema, and the other uh, were uh, focused, focusing on uh, figurations of intermediality in Eastern European cinema. And uh, somewhere in between these two discourses, uh, when uh, writing about the cultural significations of uh, intermediate images, painterly references, um, I realized uh, that I was often writing about myself. And uh, especially when it came to the interpretation of uh, uh, culturally uh, evocative, effective uh, images. And um, looking for a theoretical conceptual framework for the persisting emotional and individual effect of disturbing images, intermediate or other images in between, I found a similar preoccupation in Barbara uh, Klinger's uh, essay uh, on evocative cinematic images that she calls arresting images. And in Margrethe Brun Vargas' criticism of cognitive film theory uh, that uh, mostly avoids dealing with the individual idiosyncratic emotional effect of cinema and its spectator. As Brun Vage argues, cognitive film theory is preoccupied with general and typical spectatorial responses defined by F10 as a systematics of the emotions evoked by films. Individually and culturally, uh, different responses to film seem to lie beyond the scopes of cognitive film theory. In my presentation, I aim to contribute to this rather marginal discourse on the individual emotional impact of certain film images by focusing on a special group of arresting images, pictorial, intermediate images, and arrested images, images in between, working out a dialogue, as Raymond Bellu formulates, I quote, between the moment uh, of the camera movement of the camera and the freezing of the still image between the present and the past, inside and outside, front and back. As he goes on, these in-betweens, I quote again, affect the time, the body soul, and the position of the body gaze, which all find themselves associated with the force that could produce them, or that could at least attest to their visibility the time between the still and the moving image, end of quote. Intriguingly, he doesn't expand on this effect on the body-soul, and uh, his reflexive spectator seems to be more concerned with what she sees rather than what she feels. In, regard, in this regard, as Brun Wage also suggests, the findings of the empirical research of the reader response theory bringing evidence of the so-called self-modifying feeling triggered by aesthetic foregrounding can establish a link between the reflexive and the self-reflexive spectator. In order to illustrate my argumentation, I will use examples that are either thematizing the emotional effect uh, an image can have on its spectator, uh, the case of the Danish girl, or exemplifying the complex intertextual web of associations of an arresting image in the piano and brimstone and the shape of water. I will conclude with an account of the emotional impact of framing in Loveless. Uh, the sim sorry. <laughs> 
Um, the opening images of the Danish girl show a landscape with a group of leafless trees uh, emanating solitude and melancholia. The first scene of the film departs from the painted image of this landscape as contemplated by artist uh, Gerda Wagener at the opening event of a gallery exhibition of her husband's works. She is visibly lost in the contemplation of this painting representing something about her husband that she intuitively uh, feels but cannot name. The landscape turns back at the end of the film when after the death of her husband, uh, whom she had supported all along his painful struggle to change his sexual identity, she visits the place depicted in the painting. The return to the initial scene as, uh, as a narr narrative frame uh, here appears as a structural tool closing a psychological process launched by, with the first shot. I argue that the first scene models not only the position of a pensive, a reflexive spectator who is subtracted, isolated from her fictional context by an intermediate image, or as Raymond Bellou puts it, pulls her out of this imp imprecise yet pregnant force, the ordinary image, imagine, imaginary of the cinema. The mise-en-scene, the gallery, and the point of view shot thematized beyond the effects of suspension, freezing, reflexivity, effects that enable the spectator to reflect on what he is seeing, also what she is feeling. The puzzling painting launches confusing emotions that later in the film will be voiced as tantalizing questions about own needs in a relationship, the possession of the loved one, the limits of sacrifice, uh, acceptance of the other, and ultimately the capacity of unconditioned love. Although there are other aspects of a film that can trigger self-reflexive idiosyncratic response, such as identification with a character or intense emotional scenes, in my presentation I will focus on painterly references through framing, composition, lights or colors to individual paintings or painting as system, to use Irina Rajevsky's categories, or simply images that slow down, open up the narrative, suspend time and linger with us longer after watching the film. Besides the aforementioned individual, individual reference, in the Danish girl, a system reference, the reenactment of the intermediate gesture of pose in a painting, uh, pose as pose, as Belor would put it, stirs uh, intense emotional and bodily reaction in the protagonist prompting his desperate quest for a new sexual identity. Both the individual reference to a mysterious painting and the unexpected emotional reaction of the protagonist when sitting for a painting creates a tension, a confusion in the spectator that will escalate along the plot in line with Torben Grodin's assumption, who, coming from a cognitive theoretical field, uh, is getting probably the closest to the phenomenon I am concerned with. Uh, as, uh, as he argues, the simplest way of evoking a subjective feeling is by showing images which only elicit a very limited amount of propositions and which have no links to some concerns of some protagonists. The viewer will quickly make all the cute propositions and if the sequence goes on beyond the time when all possibilities of making propositions are depleted, the mind will shift into a subjective mode." End of quote. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, statement strongly resonates with Barbara Klinger's definition of arresting images that occur, I quote, when a film stops to contemplate an exquisitely composed, significantly evocative and or uncanny image. The forward motion of the narrative slows down or temporarily halts, allowing the spe spectacle to capture fully our attention. The exact meaning of the resting image is unclear. It is at once visually stirring and interpretively opaque. Just as it forestalls easy interpretation, its emotional effects are both intricate and obscure." Uh, end of quote. 
This preoccupation with the effect of fascinating images appears from classical to post-structuralist -structur aesthetics, cultural theory, and phenomenology, uh, and I just gathered a few of them without the uh, pretension of uh, 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 totality. Uh, last thing, Elao Cole speaks about the paintings pregnant moment, the significant instant that represents both the average and the acme of the dramatic action, thus expressing the painting in its entirety. Roland Parts in Camera Lucida def defines the obtuse meaning designating the unnameable irrational fragment that fascinates and he's all, he, he also includes a personal account of a singular experience when watching the photograph of his dead mother. Uh, Raymond Bellour sees the freeze frame and the freeze in the image as related to acts, to exceptional or fundamental moments, the green gray, ray, the blue hour, birth, death, the kiss, sexual pleasure, incest, the annunciation, the shot, photographic and cinematic. Uh, end of quote. With the exception of Roland Barth, these definitions do not consider the possibility of self-reflection of the spectator. Uh, this letter is uh, exemplified, for example, um, by Vivian Sobchak's personal account of haptic images evocative of bodily sensations and emotions related to her own prosthesis and functioning as a kind of self-therapy. Similarly to Laura U. Marx, who discusses the cultural the culturally determined role of haptic images evocative of touch and helping body memory and serving identity quest. In her effort, in her effort to explain its emotional impact, Barbara Klinger defines a resting image as a site, uh, as a site of lingering, strong, ambiguous, memorable, associative, with unusual temporal status outside of time and serving as a focal point for emotions, it activates a web of associations, personal, personal and cultural experiences, uh, and the spectator storehouse of images. It is regressive and going back to uh, another load of uh, images is uh, instigating a mini archeology span of memory of other images as a moment of intense contemplation, it defamiliarizes its contents. It is often accompanied with voiceover narration, internal monologues emanating intimacy, vulnerability, starting a dialogue between images resulting in the viewer's reflection on what she or he finds enjoyable and why. And it is opening uh, effective dimensions arising from its ability to radiate outward toward other texts. Uh, Klinger's main example of a resting image is the last image from Jane Campion's uh, The Piano, an underwater shot showing Ada, the female protagonist, floating in the infinite blue of the sea. Um, accompanied by her uh, voice over, by his voiceover, um, uttering the puzzling words of the poet Thomas Hood. First she says, down there everything is so still and silent that it allows me, allows me to sleep. It is a weird lull lullaby and so it is, it is mine. And then the, the quotation, there is a silence where hath uh, been no sound. There is a silence where no sound hath been in the cold grave under the deep, deep sea, end of quote. This closing image corresponds to Balour's account of the image in between stillness and movement, a silent freeze in the frame and connected to an exceptional existential moment, in this case, uh, a secretly desired death. As Klinger confesses, this enigmatic image with a blurred meaning has haunted her and prompted her to examine her own emotions and, entering a, and by entering a web of further, further associations, 
Rebecca and King Kong, among others, to reconsider her subjective implication in a quest for a liberated version of a feminine self. The highly associative character of this arresting image from the piano is epitomized by its almost identical surfacing after more than 20 years in another Victorian drama with strong undertones of psychological horror, Paul uh, Verhoeven's Brimstone. The image occupies the same position in the narrative at its closure and it's a, it is accompanied by a female voiceover, that of the daughter of the woman in the water. She says, uh, um, as life progresses, images blur. Are the remains of memory? Some of them true, some of them false. I remember her well. She was a warrior. In the old century, you had to be in order to survive. Uh, it is uh, as if Ada's fantasy from the piano coming true, the female protagonist chooses deliberately that by water with an ultimate gesture, a freedom, instead of being executed by her oppressors. Her smile, disturbing as it is, launches a mini archaeology of memory involving not only the piano, but also Caravaggio's Medusa, described by Thomas Mitchell as a paralyzing spectacle, uh, spectacle meant for the enemy. It also stands for, according to Freud, for the female genitals and sexuality, an apotropaic or monstrous image uh, addressing a patriarchal <coughs> order in crisis. The liberating monstrosity of female sexuality appears in a similar closing scene in a third example of this associative web, the shape of water. This image, also joined by a mysterious, this time male voiceover, quoting from Persian poet Hakim Sanai, words that again leave us clueless and linger with us, stirring feelings that are either completely new or just have never been experienced in the form provided by the film. Uh, he says, unable to perceive the shape of you, I find you all around me. Your presence fills my eyes with your love. It humbles my heart, for you are everywhere. I am aware that this sequence of association, uh, an end of quote. I am aware that this sequence of associations is a bit personal, uh, but still, uh, I uh, think that it's still, it has still very strong cultural implications. The third uh, example was suggested by somebody else to me, another female spectator at another conference. Um, Barbara Klinger speaks about a collusion between autobiography and film when facing an arresting image, revealing the personal as a strangely composite construction. In order to further elucidate this phenomenon, Margaret, Margaret Brunwage proposes the framework of the reader response theory, reinforced by empirical research conducted by Canadians Mial and Don Quicken, as they argue that unconventional flow of feeling experienced at times in literary reception can prompt unexpected realizations. Reflecting on an emotion uh, can trigger cognitive transformations. Uh, as they argue, uh, what is realized or recognized also may become realized, made real, and carried forward as a changed understanding of the reader's own life world. We propose that this process of realization through literary reading involves a form of reflexivity that is itself figurative. We also suggest that feelings integral to such figurative realization be called self-modifying feelings to differentiate them from ev evaluative feelings toward the text as a whole, aesthetic feelings in response to stylistic variations, and narrative feelings in reaction to the setting characters and events. End of quote. Uh, uh, while not identical with them, these self-modifying feelings are greatly produced by aesthetic feelings, resulting <coughs> from unsettling, defamiliarizing images that in case of intermediate references seem to lie outside the narrative as if meant to reframe 
or emotional experience stirred by the story. At the end of uh, Zbiagintsev's Loveless, uh, following the desperate quest of the missing child, exposing the spectator to strong contradictory feelings, the narration comes to a halt. The boy is found dead, and an unidentified, un unidentified gaze is moving around in the former home of the broken family, now empty and under refurbishment. The presence of this gaze is unsettling, reminiscent of ghost stories. It slowly leaves behind the workers in the apartment and leaves through the window after framing the view behind it uh, as a silent painting reminding of Peter Bruegel, the younger's winter landscape with the bird trap, probably one of the most well-known paintings in the world. The muted palette of grays, blues, and pale greens is offset by the colorful costumes worn by many of the participants uh, and the overlapping branches of the trees and brushes serve to create a wonderful decorative effect. This gesture of leaving behind a scene contaminated with so much pain and betrayal and stepping into another apparently peaceful painterly composition reframes our numbness uh, caused by the shock of this outcome as a kind of acceptance of fragility of life. In fact, it has often been suggested that the winter landscape with a bird trap, for all its realism, also contains an underlying message alluding to the precariousness of life. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, Peter Breiger, the, the elder, had uh, inscriptions on his similar paintings saying that, uh, saying the precariousness of human life referring to the ways in which people find themselves slipping and sliding through a life whose existence is more slippery and fragile than ice itself." End of quote. The modifying of a first feeling, that of terror, by a second, that of acceptance, can be conceived as a form of catharsis, understood not as purification, but rather a clarification of the spectator's emotional experience. In line with Margaret uh, Brun Vagis argumentation, aesthetic feelings enhance the uh, feeling guided boundary crossing, very plastically uh, um, figurated in this passage from the scene to the paint, sorry, painterly. So just to conclude, in my presentation, I propose to gather arguments from different discourses concerned with the elementary <coughs> power of the single image in order to contribute to, to a theoretical framework illuminating its individual emotional impact. In search for a missing link between a systematic approach to a spectatorial emotional response, the loose reflexive spectator and the self-reflexive spectator, I found that intermediate images and images in between movement and stillness due to their highly associative potential are susceptible to prone self-reflection and the clarification of the spectator's emotional experiences. The issue of um, idiosyncratic emotional response to arresting images may seem a slippery research ground, but there is already evidence of both individual and group benefits from their cultural associative value with a relevant therapeutic and educational potential, potential to be exploited. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.